Hello, welcome to a new format of video podcast that we're doing at Lattice Training. Today we have a video where I'm going to be interviewing the amazing Anoushe Hussein, and this is on a Zoom interview between myself and Anoushe. This is now a new and regular feature where we're going to be interviewing many of the world's best climbers, coaches, and super interesting climbers from around the globe looking at their stories of their background and what they get out of climbing and what they bring to climbing. Keep tuning in, hit that subscribe button and you'll see the latest stuff from us. Hello everyone uh, who has tuned into the podcast or you're watching via our YouTube channel. Um, today I have a really cool interview that I'm really, really looking forward to um, today, which is with Anoushe Hussain, um, who is on the side of the screen with me. So you'll be able to see her um, during this interview and one of the reasons why I'm actually most excited about this particular interview is uh, Anoushe is such a unique super interesting person who has I mean I'm about to go through her CV and kind of talk about all the different things that goes on in her life and you kind of go I might need a whole day to go through this stuff here um, so I'm really, yeah, I'm really excited to go through all this um, with Anoushe and, um, and break it down and also um, share with you Anoushe's story, um, her experiences. And I think she has some amazing insights, especially um, around uh, mindset, um, her approach in life, dealing with setbacks um, and all sorts of different things that may not be classically what you would think of as being uh, climbing performance or training performance. I think there's a whole uh, interesting set of things going on here. So welcome, Anoushe, and uh, are you ready to, to roll into it? Yeah, let's go for it. Okay, cool. Well, uh, first off, I want to just um, tell everyone really who you are um, and give a bit of a rundown because I said that, you know, we ha you have a really interesting CV and, you know, yep. At the surface, you look at your job and we go, okay, Anoushe's civil servant. That sounds, you know, interesting. I, I, I know a couple of other civil servants. You go, cool, that's a really, you know, high level job. Uh, you've been, you know, you know, senior policy advisor uh, and now working in HR. Um, and those are, you know, you've gone a long way in the career progression. Um, but you're also a, um, a paraclimber. Um, you've had a... Um, a whole number of uh, different health uh, setbacks along your 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 life, um, and also within your climbing career, which we're going to you know talk about quite a bit in today. Um, and I think you've dealt with a level of adversity that very very few people um, will face to the depth and the frequency that occurs. So I think there's going to be a lot of really interesting things to discuss on that. Um, in particular, you have um, Ella's Danlos syndrome. Uh, as termed as EDS, so that I didn't quite pronounce that wrong, I don't think. Um, but that's you got it right, yeah, just about. I, I know I checked with you, right. there. um, and this has some you know really significant impact into your life and also sport and climbing. Um, and uh, aside from this, um, you're a um, practicing Muslim, um, obviously, you're wearing a headscarf, and um, we don't see a lot of climbers uh, wearing headscarves, whether it's at the crag or in the gym. I know London is a little bit different as well. Um, so it'd be really cool to talk about the diversity element that we see within climbing. Uh, and you are also um, successfully and achieved the whole marriage thing as well this year. Congratulations. Yeah. Well, actually last year now that we're in 2021, but yes. Yeah. yeah. yeah I know, right? Welcome. Um, um, yeah, I know, right? Yeah. So um, actually let, let's just kind of crack straight off with um, uh, getting married um, because I know uh, I mean I, I'm married and I've, I've been for uh, some years and I know it's not the simplest thing in a normal life of non-COVID and uh, dealing with policy etc but how did how did you how did you achieve that last year with Kenneth who's also a paraclimber? Um, so you know we'd had our date and everything set up and about four weeks before we were due to get married. It was going to be the 3rd and the 5th of April. So civil wedding, religious wedding. And because I'm a uh, Pakistani background, uh, we were going to meld um, sort of uh, an English and a, and, a, and a Pakistani wedding, essentially. So there was going to be something like five or six ceremonies over a space of like three to four days. Um, and about a, a month before the wedding, um, sort of obviously seeing what was going on in Italy, seeing what was going on in China, and I was getting this impending sense of doom in me, which normally means I shouldn't do something. And I sort of went, to everybody, I said, well, 
I think we should postpone the wedding because I don't want somebody dying because they've come to the wedding. And the people weren't really going for it until I sort of used the death word and they sort of went, okay, fine, fair play. Um, <laughs> and then we just, you know, obviously we watched lockdown happen and then we were panicking because, um, so over here, you need to do a notice for marriage um, to get married. And Ken had done his, I'd done mine. And um, they're only valid for 12 months. And we'd only done them in sort of June uh, in 2019. So the problem is we were really worried that when lockdown ended, we wouldn't be able to get married anymore. And it, it turned out that when marriages became legal in the UK again, Ken's thing had become invalid two days before. So um, it, the, the drama uh, around trying to get married at that point, because... Um, councils weren't allowing new notices for marriages to take place. So we would have potentially been on a six month, 18 month waiting list trying to get married again. But at the time, I my health in first lockdown had really dramatically taken a shift for the worse. Um, and we were actually investigating me for a terminal cancer relapse. Um, they'd found stuff in me uh, in the hospital. They were doing repeat scans. Doctors weren't willing to say I was OK. Um, so there was quite a morbid moment of sort of three, four months of me going, I need to get married, but I also need to prepare for maybe potentially dying all at the same time. And we sort of used that to our advantage slightly and called the council sort of went, well, we don't know if I'm actually going to be alive in six months. Um, and they went, oh, oh, we can rush the notice for marriage then if that's the case. And we went, tell you what, should we just roll? So we rolled with it. We rolled with the whole, we basically got three councils, two MPs and a GP involved. And um, we got legally married on the 13th of June and we got religiously married on the 15th of August. Yeah. I mean, and, yeah, uh, it was the paperwork involved in getting all of that done, the hand, handwritten letters, having to literally go through in depth what had gone wrong medically to really random strangers you know i don't obviously i don't mind sharing my medical life i'm quite open about it but this was like having to really go in depth in ways you normally don't need to go in depth about um gps who were upset at the fact that they were saying no it was yeah it's crazy um and finding out on a friday morning i was going to get married on the following monday so yeah my mom then flying in really quickly to attend um what was a six guest wedding for our first one um so yeah at least you know what we got it done um i think that's probably our proudest moment for 2020 was actually getting married because i know so many people who didn't manage and obviously we had really exceptional circumstances under the at the, at the time which meant we could get it done had, had we not had the exceptional circumstances we would have been in the queue like everybody else yeah it's a proper it's a proper achievement that and i i think uh your the, the approach that you took with managing to achieve that last year sort of parallels a lot of the approaches and attitude that you have over so many things in life and you know me and you have chatted a couple of times on the phone um previously today and this you know ever since that first moment when i spoke to you on the phone i remember getting off the phone and talking to my wife and going oh my goodness, I cannot believe this. This is one of the coolest conversations I've literally had the whole year talking to someone who has such a different approach to things like setback and adversity and being able to deal with things that, you know, are non-ideal, non-ideal situations. And that got me really excited to, you know, one, be able to talk to you further and then two, you know, ongoing is talking about things like climbing and training and be able to support you in some you know respect further in the future with that kind of stuff yeah um because uh, as some of the uh, you know the listeners um and viewers may know is that you were born uh, without your right arm below the elbow um and despite this the further setbacks in your life you were born um with that limb missing um and that obviously had an impact right from from birth um so what what was that how was that for you um, with your early years, you know, for your first 10 years with getting involved with sport, um, trying different things out, seeing what suited you? And how was it with your parental support that you got through that as well? So I think actually my early years were probably very easy. And I, 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 this might sound really weird to say that, but for me, I didn't see myself as disabled as a child. 
Mm. My parents always mm-hmm. told me that everything was achievable. And if I couldn't do it exactly the same way as everything, everybody else, then I'd do it slightly differently. My main challenge was shoelaces. I still can't do them. Um, so I use curly mm-hmm. laces. And that's that's honestly something I've just decided I'm not going to put the energy towards. But I was never... My parents made sure, my mum made sure in the kitchen I was already doing cookies and stuff like any other child, but probably earlier because she wanted me to be as independent as possible. She made sure I played with like sharp needles and things like to do sewing and stuff earlier on than you'd normally give a kid that type of stuff. Again, to get me going. I was really involved quite early in sports because as a child I had balance issues. So because of that, my mum got me involved in things like Sri Lankan dancing and then swimming um, after swimming, um, there was a point where I had to quit. I didn't understand why. I got an explanation a few years later from my parents. And what had happened was I'd reached an age and a level where I was too good to be an amateur, um, but not good enough to be in the able-bodied non-amateur teams. Yeah. So they basically <laughs> wanted to put me in the disability classes. But the problem is at the time, there wasn't really a pathway for development in there. And my parents were like concerned that it would just be me swimming in a pool with other kids with disabilities because there was nowhere else for us to swim and re- reach our potential. So they moved me to martial arts, where for my first few years there, it was really nice. Um, I enjoyed it, um, got really absorbed by the sport, and then started having some real issues um, around discrimination. Um, and it was around then that I realized that even if I don't see myself as disabled, I see myself able to see, able to do things like anybody else does. Um, So I'm no different aside from looking visibly different and maybe carrying a plate slightly differently or things like that. Mm. Uh, There was, or there were other people around me, not within my family circle, not within my friend circle, who definitely did see um, a lack of a limb as me being less capable of doing things and weren't willing to think out of the box to support me. Um, I'd also experienced that with a gym teacher in school. Um, and that was really in my teenage years rather than my first 10 years. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that was, it was certainly a wake up call. It was sad. It still makes me angry because um, I feel like it's unjust. Why am I being judged for being less capable when somebody hasn't given me a chance to prove that I can do the same or even better than somebody else? Mm. Um, all you need to do is think out of the box most of the time. Um, and then also it, it's just, it may be sad for the people thinking like that because they weren't willing to see the potential in people. They weren't willing to believe in people. Um, but yeah, my first 10 years and, and my parents have for the most part been incredibly supportive of me basically doing whatever I want to do. Um, really believing, maybe a bit hesitant around the climbing when I started um, because they were terrified I'd fall off and kill myself. Um, my mum would send me articles from the BBC of people dying on Everest <laughs> when I started climbing in London. Um, yeah. Until she came to the first paraclimbing competition, um, she came to her first one. And then when she saw what I was getting out of it and how like happy I was in that environment and just how much it was giving me and how much. I was giving it. Um, next day, I, next time I had to take a break from training because I wasn't well, she's like, why aren't you at the climbing wall? You should be at the climbing wall. It was great. Total switch in attitude. So, yeah. For the most part, as I said, it's been, my parents have been incredibly supportive. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think it's, um, it's something that's often underrated in, in the development, you know, of, of any adult or, or not always appreciated that, some of the thing, some of the behaviours and attitudes that you'll see in later in life can have such uh, a close tie with those formative years, and the way that one or both of your parents, or perhaps sometimes also like extended family networks, support you in in the kind of the mindset and the attitude that you have around things. Um, it's not just about you know unconditional love; it's also about seeing their behaviours and attitude around those external things. It's also culturally was massively different, I think, my parents to a lot of my friends' parents or a wider family that I know of or wider culture. I mean, it's, I mean, disability is not necessarily seen in the same way here as it is seen in, say, other countries, in particular Pakistan. Um, 
there is that connotation like I have experienced in, in while I was in Luxembourg that you know if you have a disability you are less capable you are less able to function in society there's those worries about are you going to get married are you going to have children all the rest of it how are you going to find a husband blah 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 mm -hmm. um and my parents went against that grain they just said we don't care what others might say about our daughter we're still going to push her she's going to be as good as any normal person if not better that's what they did yeah really cool yeah, yeah. so they yeah. very much still and do you have that conversation with them now in in your later years where you you talk about that difference and that impact that they had on you so and the way that it's affected you in later in life or is it more of an unsaid thing no i'm i'm somebody who likes putting things out there like talking about things making it explicit rather than implicit so i've definitely had those conversations with them and thank them for the amount they've put into me as well yeah yeah I mean, I wouldn't be the person I am today without them. No, no. The other thing that I think, um, or at least I think, uh, I guess I, I have an opinion on, and it'd be interesting to see what you think on it, is that um, I always feel that when you when you look at someone a little bit further on in their life, when they're in their you know their thirties, their forties, and their fifties, and they're very good at something, and I very definitely rank you in being a uh, a very very high achiever around your your mind and what you're doing in terms of your mindset your approach your state management your psychology with approaching with lots and lots of different areas of your life and what I have come to the or my opinion on is that we tend to be really good at things when we're very very practiced at it and we do it for many many years not just three years 10 years 20 years you know decades do you think that growing up with a missing limb and then quickly or early on in your life as well, suffering some really serious health issues has essentially put you into a position where you've been in, in you know, in, in uh, air quotes, very practiced at dealing with adversity and setback so that now at your age, you're just a veteran. You're so good at this because you've done it so much. I say having been put in the deep end on health what health stuff certainly has meant i've had to pull myself out of the deep end but i would say i wasn't always good at it okay. and i would say yeah. i wasn't i'm not the same person i am now as i was maybe nine years ago so there was a really big switch around nine years ago and i'd say maybe even nine six to nine years ago um basically um, until i was call it 15 it was only my arm that was an issue, really. And, and I wouldn't even call it an issue because, like I said, I didn't really see myself as disabled back then. Uh, aside from learning how to self-advocate for myself because there were people who did see I was less capable and I was becoming more aware of that um, and having to learn to, to fight for myself, fight for my corner. Aside from that, um, um, that, that was my, yes, I was a bit poorly. I had bronchitis a lot and things like that, but, you know, fine. Um, it was around the age of 15 that Edo Stanlow started playing. Not that we knew back then, but I my joints started slipping out of place. I had to spontaneously stop martial arts. And I fell into um, a mindset of why me? Mm -hmm. And I was not good at getting myself out of that mindset because I was in this situation as a young teenager moving on to young adulthood of constant things happening to me um and every time i'd get some i'd get over something and you know you get over that first thing and yeah as a teenager you're not expected to be good at this you're not expected to know how to get yourself out of problems mm -hmm. um another thing in my health would fail and i get through that and another thing in my health would fail and 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 suddenly you know then then we ended up with cancer so <laughs> and it was this constant thing and when i had cancer i remember when i got told by the by my surgeon that you know anomalous cells had been found didn't want to use the c word he didn't um and he uses the words anomalous cells and i'm like in my head i'm going anomalous cells Oh, that means abnormal cells. Oh, oh, that's not good. And this is this is a sort of conversation going on. And then, and I go, you mean cancer? And he goes, yes, anomalous cells. I'm like, no, you're going to have to say the the c word. You, I'm not going to believe you otherwise. Yeah. And he says it, and I go in my head. I'm like, I 
think that's it. I don't think I can do any more of this. I am at rock bottom. Mm. Like, I don't think I can mentally cope with what's happening. What's, you know, I don't think I can cope with one more thing. Except with counter treatment, you get put into this survivor mode because you have to just do appointment after appointment, treatment after treatment. So for six months, I went into survivor mode. And when I came out of survivor mode, I was in the middle of finishing my master's. So I went into another survivor mode and then I was starting my first job. So I just jumped straight into that. And then I moved to London. Um, and I realized that I hadn't at all processed anything that had happened to me since I'd had cancer. And even the times before with the back surgery and the various other problems that were happening. Um, and I took the time in London my first two years in London to go to therapy mm -hmm. and to I think I'd realized I'd stop feeling emotions in the same ways I do now so I remember seeing a film and a film that would normally have made me cry and I couldn't cry I remember seeing friends laugh at something that was really funny and I couldn't laugh yeah so I yeah. for all intents and purposes I was probably depressed mm -hmm. um and rather than sort of and I realized something was wrong and I went to therapy and and that's kind of when I started working on the person I am today. Um, essentially, going from why me and why is this happening to me and oh my God, what am I going to do to okay, this is me. This is what has happened. It's really not ideal and I'm going to maybe have some chicken wings and some ice cream to feel bad about myself because that's okay. And it's really important to do that because it helps me get rid of those emotions park them away and go, I have now digested you guys. You don't have to, I don't have to carry that baggage anymore. This is what's left. This is the situation I'm in. What do I do? Yeah, so, so essentially- oh, Are we freezing? I don't know, I've still got you. Hello? Oh. Cool. Um, yeah, so it really, it really went from why me to, okay, this is the situation I'm in. I've digested the really hard emotions. Um, you know, I've gone, this is a really, really awful situation. I'm going to have a car. I'm going to have comfort food. I'm going to do what I need to do. Okay, this is what I'm left with. This is my situation. What am I going to do? I'm going to now be proactive. Um, and make the best of what is a difficult situation. So that's probably really only started, yeah, started maybe six, six years ago, seven years ago when it really started changing. Uh, Why started yeah. owning it? What do you think got you uh, over the threshold to be able to go to the point where you went? Now I want to take some kind of action. Was it that therapy process, um, or was it the con you know the conclusion of it and coming out of that? Because I know with therapy, often you know it'll be bracketed and go. You get ten sessions of this. You get twenty sessions of this. You, like people often commit to a certain period of time, and so was it. Was it, did that slowly, you know, cross that threshold during that journey or was it the exit from it for you? Oh, I'm still in therapy. I've never stopped, actually. Um, I think therapy for me is a preventative measure. It's something I do even if I don't always need it. Yeah. Um, I find yeah. it to be a very safe space for myself to process. Essentially, I have a complicated life. Having that safe space um, every week for me is really important. Uh, and it helps me be more resilient on my really bad moments in terms of when bad news happens because yeah. like it or not my life is now there's a lot of that coming so I like to be better prepared for all intents and purposes to know I have a safe place to melt down um but I think it was I had always wanted to move from an altitude of why me because I was so tired of going into those medical appointments and hearing news of, and effectively feeling like things were being done to me, like the world was against me, like destiny was against me, like whatever I was trying, I had no way out. Um, and I was really tired of that. It's so mentally draining to, to be in that dark space all the time. Mm. Whereas now, yes, stuff is still happening. And yes, yeah, stuff is still happening to my body. My body is still doing funny things and some of them not so funny. Um, but at the same time, I am choosing how to process that. I am choosing how to react to that and I'm choosing how to come back from it. Really different space. 
Yeah. It's, 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 and also sometimes choosing to say, I'm not going to do something about something because it's not worth the energy. And that's okay. Yeah. It, more empowering. <laughs> Hugely. Hugely. Um, you know, it's so much easier to advocate for myself when I have made the choice to own the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Even and, uh, if yeah. owning the problem might be a huge problem to own and it's quite hard. That was kind of actually uh, where we were just uh, discussing was going to lead me quite nicely into um, talking about how you how you tackle climbing, um, both the climbing, the climbing element of it. So the performance out of it, but the element of it and then also the training with having both EDS and miss it with a missing limb. How does that how does that affect both those uh, aspects? Because I think they're super interesting. Your approach with this. Um, so, uh, when I started climbing five years ago, I had absolutely no intention of training. That was not something I I that that was something I quite literally fell into. Um, I found out about national comps. I hadn't trained or in any sport since I dropped martial arts when I was sort of sixteen. Um, you know, I was going on 20, 27 at the time, uh, 26, 27. So it was so definitely not something I planned on. And my fitness levels had certainly changed. Um, I started climbing the climb, castle climbing center with my flatmate. Um, at the time, um, I was unable to get there by walking directly from the nearest tube station to the castle. That's a nine minute walk. I had to take the bus because the nine minute walk was too hard to do. Mm. And I wouldn't warm up in sessions because the warm up would tire me too much to then do the climbing on a three plus slab. So that was kind of the level of fitness I was walking into when I re when I started climbing five years ago. Um, and so the concept of training to me was not it was something I didn't actually believe I was training in my first year because if you look at the levels of fitness, when what you think about what somebody should be training in terms of when you think about when somebody trains at something, you assume it's quite high level or reasonable level, even if you're amateur. So for me, that was more, I didn't think I was. And a lot of other people were like, oh my God, you're training. And I was like, really? <laughs> it was weird. So it was definitely a mental difference there. Um, but uh, yeah, so for me, when it comes to climbing and it comes to climbing on, on a wall, so there's obviously the physical challenges of adapting for missing a right arm um, and also having to work with my left that is actually impacted post-cancer. So I have significant grip and endurance issues on my left side, including getting it above my head, um, which can cause some challenges given my left side reaches far further than my right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also there are some challenges like my right elbow, I have a shockingly good grip on it in terms of when I'm getting on a jug or, or things like that, but put me on a sloper and God almighty, I have nothing left. So uh, not at the moment anyway. Yeah, because with um, your palm, you've got essentially a really good lever, essentially, because the yeah. lip is so short where you're bending the elbow. It's actually kind of pretty useful on certain types of holds. Yeah, so my right arm is actually my workhorse. Um, because my left arm has really struggled with things above my head, when I tire out, actually, it's my right arm that's holding me on the wall and my left is actually doing the shaking a lot of the time. Um, even when it comes to the shopping, my right takes the shopping, my left doesn't. So actually my right arm is far, because it's shorter and got a lever, it's actually far stronger than my left. Mm. Um, and I don't get pumped in the same way. There's no forearm pump in my right yeah. arm. And I yeah. very rarely get bicep pump. It got to really work hard for me to get. <laughs> normally when I'm leading, it's normally when I'm leading, I get bicep pump. Yeah. Um, because I have to hang on to something, clip. But if I'm trying to reach out, I'm then flexing a lot more. Mm -hmm. So that's how on my right bicep um it just takes a lot longer to recover than normal pump as well when you do that um i'd say there's definitely yeah so there's definitely some challenges around the physicalness so trying to reach to my right side i've had to learn to become a dynamic climber quite quickly um when you compare me to most of my friends who i climb with and who i've been climbing with for years there are moves and tools in my arsenal of climbing that they don't need to do until they're 60 60 territory which i'm probably doing out on a four plus and that's just by the nature of it. And it's really interesting because a lot of people will say, wow, you're pulling off those moves. That's really amazing. And I'm like, well, no, for me, it has to have, it's become a normal mm -hmm. because I can't climb without those moves. I can't climb without being automatically much more stringent and strict of myself on my footwork. 
there's inevitably I will have to put myself in positions in balances, off balance, and much more frequently than most of my friends will, because they can reach out with their right side. Yeah. And what if the, what if the handhold is designed to be a right-handed handhold on your right side? Bloody nightmare when that happens. Um, especially if it's a dynamic hold, like as in if I have to go dynamically because I'm also short. I'm a meter fifty, which means inevitably my arm span's actually quite small. Um, so yeah, I'd say it's definitely challenging. Um, there's a lot of fear I face when I'm climbing. Um, there'll be a lot of I can't do this, and a lot of other people going try anyway. Um, and then a lot of me going, oh, I nearly got it. Now I'm going to try and try and try and get until I get it. And I think that for me is the most fun bit of climbing. It's the bit where you can nearly get a hold, you can nearly get a move, and you have to try 20, 30, 40, 50 times, three, four, five weeks of it, and you get that move. Yeah. I don't really care if I have <laughs> It's that one move. It's knowing I can get that move, especially if it's a move I've never done before. Like if it's in an angle or in a position, just before first lockdown, there was a route where I was going to have to go into a bat hang for my first time. Um, to get, um, to get a, it was a five or a five plus. It, no normal two li four limbed regular person would ever have to put themselves in that position. But it, it came out onto an overhang and I was going to have bat hang on it. And in the bat hang, I was also going to have to I had the campus onto my right arm, which was the first ever campus I got, um, ever. And I then had to move into a back hang to then sequence the move correctly. And just before lockdown, I managed to get it. But it took weeks, um, weeks of me just practicing different moves, different angles, trying to work out what to do. And I, th I think that's where I'm blessed to be actually missing a limb and mm -hmm. having physical challenges climbing becomes so much more adventurous for me than the average person yeah i mean i always argue that um actually taking any climber and setting them essentially a challenging scenario where you change the terrain you change the the rules of the of engagement in the climbing process actually massively um inflates and speeds up the learning process of uh, whether it's technical, physical, mental. And and I think what I what I've seen from you is that you you're so practiced at this because you've had a long, long time at doing this. You've you've really developed that mindset to take that approach on. And yes, you've been climbing for a good amount of time now, but you also previously did that in other sports. So I come back to this thing that I feel like you're such a well-practiced athlete in this way of taking on those challenges and coming about it and spinning it round into something that's it's fascinating it's a challenge it's a problem solving entity entity and yeah. how do i work my way around it and you come at it with like you know curiosity and excitement and you see that as being a good thing and i think that's amazing because i think it describes what all of us on a daily basis should be you know, applying to the things that we face, whether it's, you know, our climbing or our training or, or anything really is, is having that kind of mindset. And because it brings out so much product productivity. I think, I think, yeah, you've probably hit it on the, on the head. The reason I love climbing so much is because it gives me problems that aren't in my real life, which mm. is lovely, um, but it's stuff fun. I love finding solutions to it. Um, I love, it can be something as small as moving one finger out by a few millimeters and it makes a difference to how I might end that move. And it can be that small detail and, and learning about myself in the process because you learn to pay attention to detail. You learn to pay attention to body position and proprioception. Now, as a person with Ehlers Danlos syndrome, my proprioception is pretty bad on most days. Climbing has really changed that. It's actually changed my quality of life because of that. But I, I get to learn what limits I have and how many of those I can push. I get to actually experience and go, OK, no, I can't push further than that right now. And I, I, it's lovely because and when I first started climbing, I used to always assume that if I couldn't do a problem, it's because either the problem was set in a way that it's not doable for somebody with one and a half arms or it was because 
I wasn't good enough. As a beginner climber, that's how I used to always assume it. I was, you know, I had body image issues in a much bigger way than I do now. Mm. Um, whereas now I'm able to go, I can't do it because either I don't have enough strength and sometimes I'll even be able to go, I don't have enough strength in this joint or in this like limb or in for this particular mechanical movement pattern. Um, I don't have enough mobility in this movement pattern. And then what I'll do is I'll go, well, how do I gain that? What do I need to do now to gain for that one move or that one sequence? Or it maybe it's a sequence of three dynamic moves in a row. And I just simply don't have enough firepower to get through the last sequence cleanly. Mm. Um, mm. And, and I'm more than happy making a problem easier for myself to learn how to then make it harder. So if I have to add in a hole temporarily, change the angle of the wall temporarily, but replicate the movement just so I learn how to do it properly. Um, and then move that on to a harder, harder problem later or to the problem I'm trying to resolve, that's that's just progress. Making easier isn't a bad thing. It's a good thing because then you're learning. You're you're breaking it down into smaller steps. And it's making it if fear is a problem, because fear is a problem for me. Um, then it's making it less scary. So you're expanding your comfort zone slowly, which means you'll have less setbacks later on. Yeah, it, well, it's, it's very hard to learn when you're really scared, like when it comes comes down to it. Um, I, I think fear is something which plays into both bouldering, root, cl you know, sport climbing, trad climbing, alpinism, any of these sport disciplines. Um, and I think a lot of people um, sort of write it off as being it's, it's only the the domain of really hard or scary um, route climbing really it isn't. I think fear no. has so many different ways it permutates and and influences um, sport, not and not just climbing. Um, and it, I think it is important, as you said, to like understand how you can allow yourself at points to move out of that fearful environment because you need to learn, and it's very hard to do it when you're really scared. It's it's just incredibly hard to learn. Fear is simply walking into your unknown, whether that's expanding your limits, whether that's trying something new, whether that's trying something different that you've tried before, but you're in the context of you having had a really bad day at work um, and you don't have the energy to do it properly. So you're actually, your body's like, oh my God, I don't have the energy. So I'm expanding my energy to points where I've not done that before. Um, fear is simply going into something you haven't done before. No. Or <laughs> it's experiencing a trauma you have done before. To say, for instance, you had a bad fall on a wall or something, um, or you've just had an upset for some reason, and it can be anything. Um, I've had things where things outside of climbing have massively impacted my performance on the wall because um, I've been literally emotionally, psychologically impacted by what I'd heard, what I'd seen, what I'd, what I'd said that day. And I got to the wall, my climbing was awful. Um, and my coach noticed that actually I wasn't just feared. I, I was actually overwhelmed. I needed a cup of tea because I was going to break down and cry at the climbing wall, which is quite rare. Um, so it's, a, it's, yeah, it's a learning process. And I think because of the way I climb and because of the way I've had, I've had to learn, or I've chosen to learn how to live my life, I've become much more comfortable with knowing when I'm scared, knowing when I have to say, I need to back down temporarily um, and make something easier for myself because I know in the long run that means a better gain. That means an easier journey. Yeah. yeah. That means a psychologically yeah. safe journey. Which, which is really important <laughs> if you're actually going to improve in your sport and enjoy it and get fulfilled yeah. from it and, and stick with it in the long term. Yeah, it's, it's about enjoying it and being happy. And I'm not there to torture myself. Ultimately, I'm not that climbing for me is something I do because I love it. So on occasion, if I have to do a load of endurance, it might feel like torture, but it's not actually torture. It's just boring. Um, but other than that, like I'm not there to make myself upset on the wall. Mm. And, and how, how do you think it is that you... So like we were chatting uh, over email before Christmas and you were talking about the operation that you have coming up um, after. Yeah. So, you, you know, we're in early 2021 now um, and you have, a, you know, a really significant 
bit of surgery coming up and you see you come across as being so positive and just dealing with the whole situation and the whole scenario and it's just remarkable to me that you that you you see you you come across on the surface as being so effective still despite a really poor situation what is it that what's your process look like to to deal with this setback um and this kind of situation because you seem very good at it from the outside uh, and the first place. and of course you may go actually i'm like a duck and under the water it's all over the place so I, I think I think in this sense, I'm going, you're right in the sense I'm probably more practiced now than I was. Mm. Um, 2020, from a health perspective, was the year of hell for me. And I've gone from intensely training for a project pre-first lockdown to now struggling to walk uh, and now using a wheelchair when I leave my flat. And I can't use my wheelchair independently because it's too big. So my husband has to help me out. So we're really in a space of being very dependent right now. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I didn't realize I was going to need surgery. This kind of happened in last year. And due to various situations, the surgeries had to be delayed, which now means it's gone from being what was going to be an intense but easy surgery to now an intense and open surgery where we're looking at many more months of recovery um i have to say part of my process is to wallow i i'm i'm gonna say i was not particularly pleased when i heard all of this um i don't think anybody is and um, and yeah i i did let myself for me part the initial part of the process is, is to, to allow the shock to settle down of that news and to process essentially the emotions that are not going to help you. So the why me moment, the the wallowing, the chocolate, the chicken wings, if they if you need them, go for them. The comfort food, the giving myself the okay, I just need to coddle myself in cotton wool for a few days and rant about it and be really upset about the whole situation. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. that's going to then allow me to get rid of that baggage and then go, okay, what do I do now? So I did my wallowing um, and I've compa I compartment I compartmentalize my life. So there's the wallowing element done. OK, dealt with that. And it might come back and I might need to do that in a bit. OK, it's uh, whatever wallowing my body needs to do. We will do it. That's OK. It's just about recognizing when and when it's appropriate. Um, and then and then I, uh, we have a whiteboard in our kitchen. We painted our wall with a whiteboard. It's literally whiteboard paint and we plan our lives on there. So I've got the life planner going. So it is, um, I've been going, okay, well, here's the estimated time of when I should be up and walking again. Here's the estimated time of when I should be exercising again. In theory, if things go well, that's the optimistic one. That's the pessimistic one. I'm hoping to aim in the middle somewhere. Okay, when do we think I can start walking again? When do we think I can maybe start getting to the gym again? When do we think I might be able to start think, like, things like driving? When do we think I can start climbing again? So I've got sort of things to look forward to is what I've kind of done. Um, I've kind of done a um, things to look forward to. And I am planning a bullet journal for my recovery time. Um, and the reason I've done that is because I'm setting an intention that I intend to recover from this fully. Or as fully as I'm able to, because I really don't know how what that's going to look like. But I've gone, I am planning to set my intention. I set my intention this morning, actually, and I just went, this is my plan. I plan to recover. And I'm trying to think of what I'm going to put in the bullet journal as milestones for recovery. And I was thinking, should I put pain levels in or not? And I was like, well, no. Because pain levels for me remind me of the fact that I'm not recovering. And frankly, my pain's going to be really well managed anyway. So why, why do I need to mark it down? Because I'll know when I'm not in pain anymore. That's not an issue. I don't need to have a reminder of that, seeing that every day. What I do want is how many steps I can how hydrated I got, um, how much food I got through that day, um, how comfortable it was for me to stay sitting, because that's going to be, a, it's, go, it's going to be an abdominal surgery. So it's, for the first few weeks, it's going to be quite a challenge to even stay sitting without support. So how long could I sit sitting independently without actual backrests and things like that? 
you know, how good is my core going to get? That, that for me is signs of recovery. It's progress. Eventually it'll be, when can I get back into a harness? Because uh, I reckon that's probably going to be quite late in the game. Uh, but when can I start cycling? When can I start rowing? When can I start um, increasing my activity levels? When, when will I be able to push the wheelchair on my own? Because again, that requires core and I won't have much core for a while. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's very much so now going, what can I do? What can I, with what I have, because it's going to be an entirely unpleasant situation for quite a while. And, and I say that and I would swear if I could, but I'm not. So while I'm not swearing, it's going to be a very unpleasant situation. What do I do with that unpleasant situation? How do I stay positive in that? Well, I mark myself some milestones, which to the average person might seem really easy, but to me are going to be really hard. So I'm setting myself milestones. And I've also set myself a couple of projects for when I am fit. Um, so as of the 19th of January this year, I'm entering my nine years since I last had active cancer treatment. When I was reaching my five years since I had active cancer treatment, I decided to be silly and indoor climb the height of Mount Everest for a charity. It took me, I planned, yeah, I planned for it to take four and a half months. It took me six because I ended up having setbacks. I didn't know I had EDS at the time, or I did, but it wasn't something I knew how to plan for. So I didn't expect to dislocate and misalign joints in the process, nor did I expect how hard that challenge was going to be. I was like, well, I'm going for my 10 years. I haven't really done a fundraiser since that Everest climb because I thought that was tough. Um, and pre first lockdown, I was training for something really cool. and. I know it's going to take me quite a while to get back to that level of fitness. So what can I do to encourage myself to get there? So charity fundraising is always fun to do. It's something that gives me purpose. It makes me feel like I'm having an impact on the world. And that for me, it's a major driver in how I, my purpose for life. I like seeing I can have an impact on others in a positive way. So why don't I do a charity fundraiser? Because I know that's going to keep me accountable and encouraged. And that works for me. Great. What am I doing? Well, I've done Everest once, so why don't I do it again? Fine. But that's not enough because I've done Everest once, which means I, in theory, should be able to do it again, regardless of the health situation I'm in. Right? She says. <laughs> <laughs> she says. Because I have no idea. But I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that. Big assumption made there. Um, so then I was like, well... If I'm doing an indoor climbing challenge for a real mountain, can I do an indoor cycling challenge for a real cycling route? So I've decided to do an on land, above land and on water challenge without actually physically going to the water, to the land or to the mountain. Yeah. So I'm going to row, I think, the, land, the length of the Thames cycle i believe and we're still trying to make the final decisions on this but lands end to john o'groats and then indoor climb the height of mount everest as and well as and when the scarring heals and i'm able to get into a harness and then start climbing again so i will be rebuilding from a three plus upwards i mean because i will have no core but the assumption is that the cycling and the rowing will help me build up so that I can get back on the climbing wall, so that I can retrain, so that I can then get back to the fitness I was at pre-first lockdown, pre-me dislocating my my right knee, into the point where I can get back to the other challenge that I've been looking forward to doing. See that, that's like the uh, ultimate comeback. That's, I know, if we pull it off, it's great, right? It's the coolest thing, it's the coolest thing ever. Like, And I love this kind of uh, stuff. And I think there's something really important actually to pull out from this because and, and I want to ask back to you how you feel about this is that I see a a curious correlation and I've noticed this quite a few a few times over the years that some of the people that I've come across in in my lifetime who have had some of the most difficult painful really tricky setbacks and situations scenarios 
is that and those people have you know really had some hard times with with a whole different variety of things you know just the whole gamut of life is that those people when they come back and they look at their goals and the things that they're wanting to do i feel like there is a tie-in with that the the difficulty has been actually really damn hard to deal with like really hard and it's something that you kind of carry on your back and that you aim for these really big incredible achievements because in a way it tells you in your mind i'm kind of like going to be a superhero because that is such an awesome thing to do and you know what i kind of need to be a superhero to deal with what i've had to go through and what i've gone through that process so i want how do you feel about that 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 tie in with actually to have got through everything and still be effective making goals chunking stuff down dealing with your stuff whatever it is you kind of have to get into that in your head that superhero mindset of i can flip and do this and i've really got to go big with this to be in that mindset i don't know if I agree the word superhero <laughs> <don't like> um, <laughs> to me it sounds like it's like the, the i word inspirational uh, no, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um but superhero i will villain? say huh superhero villain superhero villain maybe not <laughs> um but i think it is yeah it is for me even if i don't manage my second challenge that i'm hoping to get to once i finish the soul lands and john O'Groats craziness um and I do say it's crazy because in any normal person should not be aiming to do that after major abdominal surgery. Mm-hmm. But for me, it's just telling myself that I'm okay. That I am still able to do what I want to do. That I'm still living life mm-hmm. on my terms. I might not manage the challenge. I don't care about that. I set the goal. The fact that I've even set the goal is is cool the fact that i've even made the decision that i think i can do it the amazing thing about the, this challenge is i've not set a timeline on it on purpose because i have no idea how i'm going to be post-surgery i don't want to set myself up for failure i've set myself up so that i've set given myself three different disciplines of sport of sport so that on a given week if i'm not well enough to do one type i've got the other two i can think about or on a given week, if I want to be a couch potato, that's also perfectly okay. Because that's a rest week and that's fine. Mm. I'm also going to be still juggling work as well once I'm back to normal. So obviously there's still, you know, juggling work and family time and all the rest of it. So, you know, there's, you know, I've got to, I've got to keep it real as well. But it's not about being a superhero. It's just about, it's about choosing to make the most of it. So why it's about going so so why why is it for you then that you that you, you've gone for such a really hard thing to do because it it seems to be you know highly aspirational like it is not easy to do any of those individual parts but you've stacked all of them together so I'm I'm curious as to why you've gone for such an incredible stretch goal, because I've seen this pattern with others that I've come across in my lifetime. And, and I know you may, you're you're probably, as soon as you heard that whole superhero thing, like, nah, I'm not a superhero. I'm not, I'm not having any of that. Do not put me in, do not put me in that box. But I think it's very, very hard to do. And I'm just questioning, questioning that. Okay. So there's some logic that's gone into this. Um, and and I, whenever I train or plan for training, I, there's almost always some science and some logic that I try and put behind. So either some data that I've gathered from myself, um, you know, in terms of like testing how much I can cycle right now, testing how much I can row, what my heart rate is doing, things like that to tell me where I'm physically at right now. Mm. I did Everest last time. Uh, what, if we're reaching nine years, I did about four years ago. It was a nightmare. I was constantly getting injured. My left arm hated me. Um, I'm not sure how many times I had to split my wrist. Um, and I also managed to dislocate my hip at the time. 
um, in national comps. Um, so I know how hard it was, but I also know I am a very different person physically where I was four years ago to where I am now. I have a lot more muscle mass than I did. I have learned how to maintain my body. Like back when I did the Everest challenge, that was my first big climbing challenge aside from comps. I didn't know how to do antagonist exercises. I didn't know how to maintain my climbing body. I didn't know how to eat for it either. I didn't know that I needed to replenish my protein, for instance. And I was also having, at the time, lots of digestive issues, and I didn't have a lot of options on what I could eat compared to now. So I'm in a very different physical picture now than I was four years ago. So while I know the Everest challenge is going to be hard, I know back then I could do it. So why can't I do it now? It's, yeah, it's going to be hard. But it's, I think I'm setting myself with better chances than I did back then. I say that, struggling to walk right now. But I nearly got myself a 6A just before this lockdown hit on my dislocated knee because my knee is fine when I put some straps around it. So if I nearly got myself a 6A or one move, which I can't do on my knee right now, and that's with my legs in the position that they're in, knowing I need major surgery, knowing that I've had a major decline, then, then I'm not as bad because I couldn't do six A's back then. <laughs> I, I had no hope of doing them back then. I didn't have the finger strength. I didn't have the strength at all to do it. And I didn't have the tools and techniques that I have now that I did then. As in, I didn't, do you know what I mean? Like, so in terms of the Everest challenge, I don't, yes, it's going to be hard, but I don't see that as being unachievable. It's just going to require some serious mental strength once I get into the hard bits of it. Um, in terms of the cycling, yeah, I never thought I was going to do that until I decided to. Um, it was originally going to be a swimming challenge as well. I've dropped the swimming part because I thought down that. That's really unachievable. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's, so I can cycle. I learned to cycle when I was 13, but I'm not safe on the road. I tend to crash into every single tree that exists, which means I'm just not safe. And I can't balance very well. So while I can cycle, I'm not, I'm, I'm just not, it's not, I'm not road safe. So to be able to do a challenge indoors, to live aspirationally as if I could do it outdoors, is something for me that's really important. I will never go to Everest and survive that type of climb. I know that. But that doesn't mean I can't do it indoors and live aspirationally to do that. I think that's why I've picked something big. I've picked something that if I had the physical capability, I would choose to do it in real life. But because I can't, I'm choosing to do it indoors. I'm making it an adaptive challenge. Yes. That's what I'm doing. I'm making the most of what I can do within the circumstances that I have. Not being a superhero, I'm just trying to live the life I would live if I didn't have the challenges I did right now. If I didn't have the disabilities I had right now. Okay, I, I will. I will. I will take back the the superhero. I will. I will take that label back into Sheffield, and, uh, I, and I will. <laughs> if you think I'm a superhero, that's fine. Just basically, don't tell me. I'm more than happy. People thinking what they whatever they want to think of me, if that helps them. I, I have no issues with it. I just have an issue being told of it myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's cool. I think it's really cool. Really, really cool. Um, and I, I think there's yeah lots of things that you can learn and take and pull away from your approach yeah. to things um and i feel like i could i oh mean I, I feel like i could like just write a a chapter in a book off the the approach that you have a lot of this stuff and um it's it's just a really really cool um because it's so usable and it's so adaptable to everyone on this planet whatever they're doing um and it's I always like talking to people who I think are making the best use of what they have in any given day and situation to deploy the most happiness, satisfaction and effectiveness. Um, and, and it's good seeing someone being really good at that and really practiced at it. Um, it's cool because you. You, you can learn a lot. Um, I'm going to ask you one last question. Uh, Go for it. And um, it's uh, sort of uh, aside from, you know, the, the 
the even bigger, uh, greater challenge that you have um, with your Everest challenge um, or your your three way challenge is what 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 do, what are you kind of looking forward to um, in the next few years um, aside from you know the big challenge in terms of you know your sport and uh, family and work and life. What, what sort of things are you you excited about and looking forward to? So in terms of sport, it's pretty much get through the next two challenges and then I will reevaluate uh, my relationship with climbing. I like reevaluating my relationship every three months as it is. Mm-hmm. I always check in with myself whether I'm happy with it, whether I'm challenging myself in a way I'm happy with challenging myself. Um, and I think over the last couple of years, I've definitely reevaluated and questioned whether I want to be competing anymore. Um, I just at the moment don't feel that it's giving me the same satisfaction as, say, a challenge like doing an indoor Everest climb. Um, I think I learn a lot more about myself in that process. And I think where I'm physically right now as well, I need to be recategorized at the nationals. And there's a lot of shifting around what categorizations and I feel like I don't want to get into that politics. So I'm just going to drop out for this year and prioritize what is essentially something that's going to give me a lot more fulfillment and a lot more um, physicalness. Um, uh, one of the projects I've had in mind and I've wanted to get because I know every climber wants to get it is to get my first 7A climb I, I've been itching for it for years and I keep getting really close to like a 6B 6B plus done it nearly got my first 6C and then I get a setback so for me it's one of those things I want to have enough health to get myself to my first 7A um, and equally to my first say 6B overhang climb as well because that would be flipping awesome so yeah, that's kind of like grade wise, I'd really want to be up there. I want to get outdoors much more. Um, if not this year, then in the future, I want to restart this year if I can. This is 2020, I couldn't, I physically couldn't. It was just not an option. Um, there are now climbs we think I can do adaptively. So I want to try and get out there a bit more. I really enjoyed going outside a couple of years ago. I felt it gave me so much more than indoor climbing. I just haven't had the chance um, or the opportunity. So that's definitely a plus. Um, Work life, just carry on working really, carry on doing what I do. Um, I love doing the job I do right now. Um, So progressing within that, I guess, um, finding more opportunities to, again, stay fulfilled. Same with my family life. Um, That we'll we'll find out when that happens, what happens with that, I guess. can't really say so yeah and then yeah keep also going on the public figure public speaker trying to create change trying to highlight barriers that any individual can make an impact towards changing rather than looking at um the mechanisms of society as a whole i'm looking at what can we as an individual do better to make it life more inclusive for the people who are currently not included. So one of the things I noticed a lot more in 2020 since starting to use a wheelchair is when I go to the shops or when I go to the restaurant or something like that, I might speak, but they don't listen. Um, And that's only since I've become a seated person outside. And I'm no different a person. I'm not less capable of speaking. I'm not less capable of advocating for myself. And yet I struggle having a conversation with the person that is still in a shop because they won't, you know, they won't give me my card back, even though I was the one that gave it to them, things like that. Um, uh, It's not okay for that type of thing to be happening. It's not okay that people still think that's normal. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, human beings at the end of the day. So that's type of things like that. If I can create some change, make life a bit easier for everybody, then that's something I still want to keep doing. Yeah, am- amazing. I mean, you're you're a you're a real uh, force to be reckoned with, um, and uh, it's uh, it's it's really cool uh, all the stuff that you do, and and there's just a huge um, range of things that you're active with, and that you find time and energy for. Like, you know, I feel like a pretty busy person, and I try and cram as much as possible into 24 hours, but you know, you're you're a co-founder of Power Climbing London. Um, you're um, an ambassador for two different organisations. Um, you've got this hardcore job. 
um you just got so so much on and, it, and it's it's really cool to see that you also want to come go back and impact and uh, you know and change lives for other people as well um you know it's such a kind of selfless giving thing to do um and i'm sure that you know anyone listening to this will um find it as being an, an amazing thing and, and i hope that um you know our chat today um, will lead some people to you know look up what you do and uh, and listen more to the conversations that you've been having um and uh, actually uh, for anyone um watching or listening um where can they find I i'm guessing you I'm pretty sure that you've got a website and I know you have um, like a social media and handle and things like that. Where can everyone find you? So Instagram is at Anusha Hussain. Uh, Facebook is at Anusha Hussain one. Uh, otherwise you'll find my personal profile. Um, and then our website is Anusha Hussain.com. Uh, but frankly, if you want to follow, you're probably better off actually on Facebook and Instagram more because our website needs updating. Um, so yeah, that's basically me. Um, you can occasionally find me on LinkedIn as well. Oh, brilliant. Well, um, well yeah. I'm doing more professional yeah. posts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and just if we go, yeah. just spell um, Anusha Hossein is A-N-O-U-S-H-E-H-U-S-A-I-N. Um, That's me. So get the spelling right um, and you'll um, find her um, on yeah in Instagram, um, LinkedIn, uh, website as well and um, just thanks so much for um, spending no an hour, hour of me chatting about all this different stuff it's been it's been really cool and really nice it's to really chat fun as again nice uh, to chat to you too and, uh, we'll and thank you for having me oh, of course no, no problem at all and we'll, we'll I mean no, we'll chat on the phone again very soon well oh thanks cool. so much you say